Okay, thank you and welcome for coming here, everyone. It's a bit too low, let's do it like this. Um, uh, to my talk here at OSS Japan, I'm so happy to be in Japan again. Uh, it's a lovely conference so far and I, here's my contribution to it. Uh, with a talk about object lifetimes and if this is a threat for safety certification, which is now an ongoing trend, trend uh, a lot of people are aiming, or some people are aiming for it, and um, here's what I want to say about it. Let's see, I have to go here, and then it should work. So first, let me introduce the problem shortly. It's not a technical, so much technical talk. If you want the technical talks, see this slide, and from this slide, you can also see that uh, it's kind of a current trend. So Linux, uh, Lauren Pichard started this discussion at last year's plumbers. Bartosz picked it up and contributed more by saying what Lauren said, oh, it's more about managed devices. And we found out it's not only about managed devices, it's actually worse. It's about general lifetime issues. Uh, then I investigated further and found out that not only the subsystems we know of, but some more are affected. <coughs> and then quite new, just a few weeks ago, Bartosz went again to uh, Linux plumbers saying this is basically a problem with a lot of uh, provider consumer settings we have within the kernel. So someone provides something like uh, I2C bus and someone consumes the I2C bus. It can be a GPIO, it can be an MTD device. Lots of things we have and some of them are vulnerable. You see Bartosz and I are playing a little bit of ping pong here and uh, he called it like the Netflix miniseries. So it's mainly the both of us who are having a keen interest in that and are, are driving to push this a little further because we need this thing, this needs to be fixed. Some of the issues are very, very old. So just a simple overview of the problem. Let's assume you have some SOC and here's a platform device with an I2C controller. I'm, I'm, I'll be talking about mainly I2C because I'm the I2C maintainer, so I know this best, but it could be a GPIO controller or whatnot. Uh, let's assume here it's, it's a platform device and uh, this is describes the real hardware on the chip and then to uh, en enable to uh, give this functionality to user space, we have a logical device, intermediate device, which is an I2C, the I2C adapter. This one ins instantiates that, so we have a ref count of one. This is a lot of our ref counting here. And then user, this is a good case. This is how we want it. This is you, how it usually works. Uh, in most cases, uh, let me emphasize firsthand, uh, this is not like, it, it may sound like Linux is totally broken. It is not. You know, uh, in, in most of the cases, Linux does a very good job of doing all these things, but now, as we're approaching like safety certification, we really, really need to get more of the corner cases ready, especially if we know that we have corner cases and we should now, it's now the time, I, th I think it's time to tackle that. So in the good case, here's a consumer in this, it comes from user space, it could be kernel space, it doesn't matter. Um, and it wants to talk I2C, so it connects to this device and we have a ref count of two because this and this are talking to this device. This is the normal case. Normal case is that somewhere in user space is finished talking to it, this this goes away, so this connection goes away, ref count goes to one, and obviously then if this device is somewhere going away, it will cancel this connection because it, it in instantiated it, so it can instantiate it. Ref count is zero, this device can go away, and finally this can device can go away. Everything's good. This is how we want it. Now let's go back to the case where we have here the provider, again it's generic case, uh, with the intermediate device and the user space calling to it. Now one of the problems we have is what if before this user space device says I'm finished, it stays around, this device is going away. And we have two problematic, uh, we have more cases, but I'll, I'll describe two problematic cases here. The first one is if, uh, which is uh, sadly true for I2C as well, if this physical device embeds this logical device, it's not separated. That means whenever this goes away, this goes away. It's gone. 
Then we have a huge problem because this device is still there and wants to talk to this one. It has it's even ref counted. Actually, it's the it's a prime task of, a, of an operating system to ensure that the ref counting means something. But it, in this case, it's meaningless, you know. So this is really bad. It's not so uh, common in the kernel, but there are some, subs some subsystems which are still affected. This is a really bad case. And another problematic case too, uh, which we have is not if it's not embedded, but still if there's no like synchronization be between those two. So this device goes away and this one does not know about it. So then we still have the problem that they can talk because this did not disappear, but when, when you want to talk here, then there's nothing and uh, you will also have problems. So we need to make sure that this device can go away. This one somehow knows about it and can then report an error so we can gracefully handle the error. But with these two, uh, two problematic cases, we're not there yet. And uh, to see that I'm not making this all up, I have a small demo. Uh, So I'll be running. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'll be running a QAMO instance now with a kernel 6.7 RC4. So it's from this week. And um, uh, I will show you what I do now. Uh, I will open a, a file from the MTD subsystem. I will just open it. It could be a file system wanting to read from it. Uh, I just used a one-liner here to open it. And now I'm going to unbind the driver. And uh, in my presentation in PROC, this crashed at this level, so uh, some, things, some things have happened, which is good. But what I do now is, uh, I, I still have this user space process open, you know, um, which is still trying, it could be a file system which is trying to read whatever, and now I'm trying to close this one, and then bam, that's a crash. And then, uh, it's not a super bad panic. We get to the login prompt again, but still this is not anything where you can gracefully handle this problem. And this is not some rare subsystem. I mean, MTD is important, right? Um, I could have shown you, uh, if I show you the same thing about I square C, you would see it's not crashing, but it's blocking because it, it has some protection to see, ah, there's still an open file descriptor I'm not removing the stuff, I'm waiting for the file descriptor to be closed. But that means it's kind of a deadlock, you know? The one is waiting for it to be closed, the, the thing with the open file descriptor wants to do something, but it cannot do something anymore. So this is still not gracefully, it's still not an error saying, hey, oh, my provider is gone, I can't do anything anymore. So uh, this is also bad. So we have that, and um, so Mike, this is what Bartosz and I were working on, on various different problem spaces. And my question, since I, I was interested in, in safety 
Recently, does this affect safety certifications? Can you get safety certifications for Linux if, you know, if we know we have such problems? Especially if you, we have these problems for such a long time. If you look at the problem from MTD Core, there's a comment saying, oh, we should do this better, basically, from 2009. And this is a command in the I2C core. This is old code and should ideally be re replaced from 2015. But the code is pre-Git. So, and nobody ever took the challenge to fix this correctly. And um, so, you, you wonder, uh, especially if you have a generic, if you, there are some people, if you try uh, address safety, they try to uh, argument with the safety by process. Um, argument. Linux has proven that you can fix uh, issues, they can fix issues over time. They could even include preempt RT after a certain amount of time, so they can do basically anything, right? So with that kind of argument, they try to approach safety. Uh, but how will this affect safety if you know, okay, we have this problem for, what, 18 years and nobody took care of it? Will this affect? And I ask a few people around and the answer is like, like a lawyer, lawyer answer, Maybe. <laughs> I, I cannot give you a definite answer because it really depends on the assessor if the assessor knows about it and take, takes it as relevant or not. My gut feeling, but don't quote me on it, <laughs> is it's not so much of a problem, but it might, it might hit you if you're going specific. Because another approach, or the main approach in certification is that you define a subset, you get a set of requirements. I need that from the Linux kernel. And I want that part of the Linux kernel to be safe. So, and what you could now do in theory is, I say in my requirements, we're not unbinding devices and all this goes away, right? I will just in, I, I will boot it. Everything is there, and it will never ever be removed. There might be cases when that works, but uh, I really want to think you about the following slides to see if that approach is really good for you. On top of that, this is not a defensive approach. I mean, if you want safety, you want a safe product, and if you know you have problems, I think a good attitude is to let's fix that. Because we have so complex systems, even if the known, if you can set up your requirements in a way that these problems I'm showing you are not affecting you, there might be other problems we don't know yet, which might be affecting you. So if you solve the problem at the core, I think you're in a much better shape. But let's still go to this. Okay, can I can I have a specification where I define I'm not unbinding? What you definitely lose is all hot pluggable buses. <laughs> Because with hot pluggable buses, an unbind event can happen always, and you don't know when. And even if you say, "Ah, oh, well, I don't, I don't have a USB port where users can plug in stuff," uh, I have seen, uh, I have been in a project, in a rail, rail, railway related project, where they were hard soldered USB devices, if kind, some kind of a USB stick. And with a combination of not perfect USB design and hardware and a bit of uh, noise around the device, there were sometimes sporadic unbind devices, although the device was soldered. So you still can have that. Um, and to sh So uh, hot pluggable buses are the big problem. And if you see, I, I got this slide, thankfully, yesterday from my friends of, from Renaissance. They have a great demo uh, there in their booth. And in their talk yesterday, they were uh, display, uh, explaining their setup, which is, uh, I think, quite of nice. Go check it out. But what I immediately th saw was here, this, this exclamation mark is from me. It's, it was not in the original slides. Here, they have an alcohol sensor, and it says plug in. So even in complex systems today, uh, with all the functional, uh, with modularity you want, also in cars, not only for consumers, plug-in is a thing. So, and when you have plug-in, you you're 
con uh, bound to these uh, life cycle problems. Another thing is, uh, if you want like to recover from bad states or st from stalled sub devices, at, I've been talking at Plumbers to a, a Qualcomm engineer. This, so this is a Qualcomm based phone. And they, he said though they connect the, in their phone to another processor and you use remote proc to talk, talk to it. And they have a watchdog to make sure that the firmware on that remote processor is alive. And when this watchdog fires, Linux needs to take measures so, um, so it will come up again. And what they wanted to do originally is like unbind the device, recycle, uh, uh, power cycle it, uh, restart the clocks everything like so uh, they can get into a clean state and have that sub devices this co-processor again and they had really to struggle to get the unbind correct they were they were totally running into these issues you could try to work around it in a driver but i think you need if you have a clean unbind and bind this is the, the cleanest solution because you want to your driver should be able to clean up properly right in any case, so a corner case, which is for now theoretically for me, it's uh, it's when you want to reboot. Usually, reboot is pretty safe because user all user space processes are killed, file systems are unmounted. Um, so you probably have, if you have a provider, you won't have any users at the time it is killed. While working on all this, I found a theoretical problem, at least in the I2C subsystem, maybe more, which is a rare, rare race condition where I2C could stall when trying to shut down the device or to reboot. I'm working on the proof of concept. I'm sorry, I'm not there yet. Maybe it's all wrong. So this take this with a, uh, a little bit cautious of that. But uh, if, if I found the race and if I have a proof of concept, I will show you. I will tell you for sure. This all was started by Laurent Pichard from the media subsystem. And I know a lot of people in the media subsystem complain about lifetime problems because they have complex device structures and interconnections with them. Um, I have not researched yet so far because um, they use a lot of stuff like I2C's and GPIOs. So the, bu the building blocks for G media are not proper yet. And I think the building blocks need to be safe first and until we talk about media. And also the media guys have their own set of problems in that regard, which they need to fix first. But um, I think what we are currently right now seeing is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, it's like I thought that Bartosz and I are playing ping pong with our talks and our research. And usually when we meet after a while, the first one of the first things we say is like, oh, it's actually worse than we thought because we have found something new again. Um, so I think it's a good thing to address this issue. So now I'm telling you about lots of corner cases and about that your specification might be vulnerable. How, but how do you find out if your specification is vulnerable? And what I've been working on is, I call it LITS, Linux Life Cycle Issue Test Suite, which is a, run, a set of tests which will trigger all the problems I mentioned. And uh, with a description of the problem, if uh, existing a path to a solution and which source files are, are affected. So why did I knew another test suite? I mean, there are plenty out there. Uh, the problem I had with my test suite is that, for example, K-self test within the kernel, um, tests are expected to pass because we want to do regression testing you're not so expected to fail, especially not if your test failing means the kernel crashes, the kernel blocks, or gets you back to init. Um, so I, I clearly need a test suite which has a device under test, and I was not able to find one so far. If you know one, I'm all ears. There used to be something like LTP slash 
DDT, but it's uh, stale for 10 years now. But if you know a test suite which has lots of tests for devices under test where I could I just add my tests to, I'll, I'd be more than happy. So far the plan is I'll get this test suite running and once a test, w once something turns green here and passes, then I convert it to K self test and submit it to the kernel. So we then have the feature of the regression testing. What, what it basically is, is a collection of configuration, uh, the test scripts and self. How do you trigger uh, the things I've just shown manually, how, like you've seen the MTD crashing. A specific kernel configuration, I need a specific uh, root file system, this, so we have built root configuration. As a test framework, I didn't write it from scratch. I use Avocado from Red Hat and um, then some scripts to run the test suite. And this is of it shall be all open source. Uh, the test itself, uh, I want to have a repository for the whole test suite and I want to have a website where all this is, uh, if you don't want to run the test, you can just check how it is. And I really wanted to present it here, but sadly I could not get it done because uh, uh, it was much more work as I anticipated. The first thing was I started testing with real hardware but to make tests easily accessible, I switched to QAmmo and had to had to find devices which kind of are suitable for my for my test cases. I wanted to run a generic uh, root file system. Eliza provides one, and I really wanted to use that, but it has just too many features I don't need, and some features I need which they don't have. So I end up ending a simple root file system with build root. And I think Avocado is a nice and fun project, but you could really see that their usage is use case is very different from mine. And so I was hacking quite a lot to get it suited to my needs, which was kind of fun. But on the other hand, I would actually prefer to write the tests instead. Um, so again, if you know something where uh, a test suite which is using devices under tests, then I'm all ears. But I can show you a little demo from that a result of that test run. Oh, where is it? <coughs> so it's not super much, but it it's just a test suite, right? So uh, here's uh, th the f test. Uh, UART is a, the so-called good known taste ca test case. So with the things how we want it to be. Test cases for SQLC and MTD all run in QAmmo with the latest kernel. Uh, the final website should have uh, iteration over different kernels. You, you probably can see the development or improvements there. And here on the whiteboard, you can see which files are affected. So that you know, those are the files causing problems. And the good thing about this is that uh, ELISA, the ELISA project now has uh, a mechanism, was working on a mechanism where you can map your specifications to source files and test themselves. So if we combine their effort that you, someone has a specification of what I want to do regarding safety, and you combine it with this test suite, um, then you're immediately known if you're affected or not by these lifecycle problems. Another idea is that there's this database called vulnerable code, which might be an uh, interesting point to deploy all this information currently from, from a glimpse. They only have like 
they can say this or that package is uh, affected. So if I say the Linux kernel is affected, I think this is a bit too coarse. We need a finer granularity for that to see in this kernel this subsystem is, is affected. So you know, know now if you're affected or not and what's the next steps. The good news is, uh, for all the issues I presented here, we have a path, we have potential solutions, we have drafts for that. We know, especially at Linux Plumbers, uh, a few weeks ago, Bartosz uh, talked about his idea how to, to solve the, a lot of these issues in one go. This is mainly that you add kind of a wrapper to the subsystems which protects the physical device. And then you use RCU to make sure that you have critical sections. If the user space is going to read is to read from this provider, then the subsystem will make sure that it's not going out away while it's accessed. And on the other hand around, if you're removing the provider, RCU makes sure that nobody's reading from it. And so this is an approach where you can put stuff into subsystems away from drivers and and still have have a good protections and we're also thinking about like at another abstraction put like a layer uh, make a layer out of it so can then other subsystems can just use this extra layer to have the safety so they don't have all to reinvent the skill from scratch and uh, at linux plumbers uh, at the talk there were was quite quite a few people attending the talk and actually we came to a consensus so uh, it was it was said that uh, yeah that's that's what we want to try to fix these issues and after all these years I, we were all very happy to see to path forward I think you know some issues are pre git and the roadmap we have is uh, we're fixing two or three subsystems because proposal is i square c and gpio because that's a where the things Bartosz and I do maintain. Greg, for some reason, mentioned USB. I don't know why. <laughs> um, and then we see how this works out and how we can make this generic layer from these two or three existing implementations. And when we have that, then we can go fix all the other subsystems. And f from that point on, it would be really great if we have, uh, so then that will be where a lot of people can chime in and say, okay, I'll take this layer and fix my subsystem. Um, this is quite some work. Um, the problems is uh, when works take su such a long time, it's a moving target, of course, because the subsystems we want to fix still evolve besides our intentions. And, um, they will be intrusive, so backporting will be pretty hard. It will, it's probably a job of it, uh, its own, but uh, we have proven in Linux that we can do stuff like this. But still my um, call out here is the sooner the better. Let's not wait until the technical debt increases anymore. Yeah. As I said, it needs serious efforts to go upstream. But Bartosz and I really, really, w after all this year, wanted to see that fixed uh, because we want Linux just, we, can, we can't stand that Linux has problems in that area. That's like it's our, I don't know, our pride. And also I want, a, I want safe products out there. And if I know there's a problem, I want to fix it. Um, but currently we're working very, very part time on that. So Renesas is a bit supporting me. Uh, Bartosz is a bit supported from Renaro. But with the current <coughs> uh, work we can spend into it, this is going. This is a matter of years until we have this generic layer. So the hint: we both. W uh, I work for Renesas, Bartosz works for Linaro. But at the basic level, we are both contractors. <coughs> so my conclusions. The kernel definitely has long-standing issues regarding object lifetime issues. These might or might not hurt the general safety by process arguments. That was the lawyer-like maybe I was saying before. Depending on your use case, it 
will affect your specific safety process. Uh, if you uh, know that you're using a vulnerable subsystem, then I think you should do something about it. To find out if you're affected or not, there is a test suite developed. It's under development and I hope to release it as soon as possible. And a draft for solutions to these problems exists and uh, wants to be implemented. And yes, we are looking for funding to drive the, and I'll be honest, I, we are looking for funding to drive this forward so that we can finally they make a check mark on this and have this uh, issue solved for once and for all. And this was this uh, what I wanted to talk about. Uh, thank you much for your attention and if you have questions I'm all eager to hear them. Thank you. So I'm kind of a dumb dumb at this level so forgive me if this is a dumb question but why do you think this problem has lingered for so long? Uh, you talked about it predating Git. Uh, it, it seems not great. Like, and then kind of related to that, from people who have like embedded deployments or you know, like here we have a lot of automotive grade Linux. Have you seen any like creative hacks to work around this sort of problem? Like, does that help, you, or is it just most people aren't affected by it in practice, or they just reboot their computers and like? Uh, that's not a dumb question. <laughs> so um, I think one reason is part of the industry doesn't, it's, it's really corner cases, right? Mostly work, Linux is working great. And uh, part of the, some industries do not care so much about it. Like my stepson is used that his, his phone crashes once in a while. He does it, so he reboots. So. Pff. And other part of is that this is a lot of work, this is dirty work, and uh, I hear, heard experienced Linux kernel developers say, oh no, I'm not ma making my hands that dirty. And uh, in, in, yeah, there be dragons, <laughs> basically. Fair enough. <laughs> Rick, do you want? I think Rick wants to add something. Uh, hi, I wrote that comment about 28 years ago. <laughs> no, 20, 25 years ago. Um, when we first converted I2C to the driver model. Um, we, when we created this, we did not have removable I2C devices. We did not have removable anything but USB. So when we did this, we said, ah, if anybody cares in the future. And then bind and unbind was a debugging aid. And the fact that people use it in production is so scary. Um, so that's why. I mean, this, it's just grown into something. And then it works for most everybody. Although unbinding devices is not necessarily tied to unbind from SysFS, you can just un, well use hot plugging device, remove a hot pluggable device, right? Well, yeah, hot pluggable devices is to emulate that. Yeah. Hot pluggable devices, yes. Exactly. But I2C, there's never been on a hot pluggable bus before. Now it can. And to add that, um, what Greg also said at Linux Plumbers, the solution Bartosz now provided is a pretty up-to-date solution because back the SRCU wasn't uh, av available back then, so we couldn't have that solution, but we can have that now. Yeah, thank you for those insights. I would like to add something on that, um, just to make you less happy even more. Um, I think there are, there are more race conditions that. like that. Um, so specifically the re reboot case comes to my mind because I ran into something like this on a, well, it's a nasty downstream kernel from some AI producing IP vendor. Um, so the point is actually you may also have races over the hardware. I think in that case, so currently we pushed it away to the vendor and said, okay, do you have a problem there on reboot or power down? Um, I think it's, it's a case a race around the um, MMU, IOMMU. So shutdown of OMU coming before the transactions are done. Mm -hmm. I also comes to my mind regarding interrupts. Um, is your test case covering these cases? So basically you're shutting down also certain hardware bits if there are in-flight activities, can this be covered as well? I mean, this is all the nasty corner case we can have in, in shutdown scenarios. 
Um, and, and this is actually a real case we can say, uh, well, we have to be able to power down or to reboot the device. If it's stuck there, we have a major issue. Sure. Um, so what you describe is another set of like provider consumer problem. Provider, providers going away, consumer has a problem. And what I said about reboot, I think this is theoretically also with I2C. So I can, I'm just working on writing a test case for exactly that. The thing is, uh, initially I wanted to go with a vanilla kernel. This kernel I was showing you was 6.7 RC4. If you really go for that test cases, I, I'm quite sure you need additional modified kernel code or additional drivers or whatnot. So probably when I release something, we will also have a kernel tree which has extra code to make these rare race conditions visible. Is, isn't there something for, for, for error injection in the kernel already to make these kind of things uh, artificially reproduced? What if something goes wrong? Would it help for that? Um, and it, it, I, I, what I, the first, uh, I think that race conditions are super hard to so I, I would like write, I, I prefer to write code uh, which kind extends the critical sections which are in a usual reboot very small. And error injection does not help you to get you a, a large time frame where this race can happen. So this is where what I would approach. Sorry, I hope I'm not becoming that guy. Uh, this is, uh, do you know if anyone's done any security research in this area? I'm just curious if there's any like cases of people like using this to like get access to systems or something like via these like hanging devices or anything? Um, I haven't, uh, I'm really coming, speaking safety here. I haven't researched security. Mm. Um, <laughs> I'm not an expert on that, sorry. No, no, that's I, I don't think, uh, but Greg has something to say. <laughs> These are issues like mind and unbind, you have to have root already. And otherwise, if you have physical access, that's another issue. So physical access, we don't really care about. Sometimes you do, but yeah, it, this isn't really a security issue. It's, it's a crashing issue. The good thing about this is uh, it's, really Linux immanent, so it's pretty hardware independent. This is why I switched from a board to QMO, because you can, as long as you have some MTD device, you can show it's broken. It doesn't need to be a specific MTD device. Um, so this is, uh, this, this is a good thing. <laughs> Talking about Rust for Linux, uh, Rust has very different lifetime approach. So, in Rust code, should we should we care about the new approach about the new lifetime handling in Rust code? If we we write if we write the bindings to the media subsystem or I squared C subsystem. Um, I understand the question. I am not a Rust expert enough to uh, comment on the how Rust manages. I know it manages lifetime issues very well, but I don't know how this maps when it connects to existing code in the Linux kernel. Obviously, if you write whole Linux in Lus Rust, then we would be in a much better position, but this is, of course, a very <laughs> different story. Um, uh, so, uh, I'm not enough a Rust expert to comment on that, but maybe Greg is. <laughs> so, the big problem with Rust and the kernel is this. C has a lifetime rules, Rust has a different one. Interaction there, nobody's attempted that yet, and that's what I keep saying is going to be the hard part. Look at all the drivers, they're not even getting close to that. But that being said, the Rust object lifestyle life cycle is totally different. It's dealing with code and copies. This is real life cycle. So Rust code is gonna have to be modified to deal with the C side. So it's, Rust is not gonna solve this problem at all. 
But that being said, we've done a lot of driver core changes to make the rust side easier. And like I said in plumbers, this work is going to make it easier. So this is actually going to make it possible that rust can work. Right now, rust can't work to solve this at all. Yeah, because it adds, that's similar to what I said, it adds on top existing C code. Uh, the only solution would be uh, to re if you have everything rust, it would be different, but we don't have that. Okay. So I'm wondering what to care when the new approach comes in and you know we, we are doing a uh, very difficult task for handling uh, in, in kernel lifetime approaches in rust so uh, does it does the new approach affect the <laughs> current current rust uh, lifetiming handling but you, you don't know that so <laughs> thank you <laughs> <laughs> well if we have the new scheme it will be better for everyone that can i say <laughs> rust or c okay time is over thank you very much for coming thank you very much for the great questions and i uh, hope you still have a great conference